Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's lecture. My name is Noah Kogut Levine, and I am a senior at Princeton High School in Princeton, New Jersey. This is the first of five, five online lectures about climate change that I have organized together with my two school peers, Ava Ramirez and Grace Bolding, in conjunction with our AP Environmental Science class taught by Professor James Merck. Over the next seven weeks, the series will feature five different speakers who will address a set of varied yet inextricably linked issues concerning global warming. These include today's lecture on the politics of climate change, followed by lectures on our food system and on how tree rings serve as records of past climate change, on species extinction, and finally on sea level rise. You can find all the details about the speakers and their lectures on our Instagram page, climate underscore Princeton. The 2021 IPCC report by the United Nations determined that climate change is undeniably occurring today and is being caused by not just human activities, but by preventable human activities. One thing that has struck me since I started delving deeply into issues of climate change is how little people know about a phenomenon that threatens the very existence of mankind. Renowned author Jonathan Safran Foer has commented that the sheer magnitude of climate change has turned it into an unfathomable and abstract concept in our minds. We are unable to adequately process the full scope of impacts that we will experience as a result of global warming. Furthermore, it is a common belief that climate change is an event that will occur in the distant future, not in our lifetime. However, there are already millions of people being displaced by and suffering from climate change today. Indeed, this is a very serious issue that every generation alive today will experience at some point and in some fashion. Even so, there are still many things we can do to prevent or minimize the consequences, which is why it's extremely important for us to learn what we can do to help and how we can replace our current habits with more sustainable ones. I hope very much that this lecture series will do exactly that and that people will leave it knowing how to be better stewards of our planet, our only home. Before my colleague Grace introduces today's speaker, I would just like to give you a few technical details about today's event. The lecture will last about 40 minutes, perhaps a bit longer, followed by a 20 minute Q&A session. We ask you to please submit your questions using the Q&A function at the bottom center of the Zoom window on your phone or computer screen. The lecture will also be recorded and subsequently posted uh, on YouTube for public on-demand viewing. You will be able to find the link to the recorded lecture on our website. I will post a link to the website in the chat and the link can also be found on our Instagram page, climate underscore Princeton. My colleague Grace will now introduce today's speaker. Thank you very much for joining us. Okay, so our first lecture will be Dr. Miriam Shakao, a socio-cultural anthropologist who teaches at the College of New Jersey. Uh, she received her PhD from Harvard and has published a book called Bolivian Highway, Social Mobility and Political Culture in a New Middle Class. The focuses of her research include new middle class politics in Bolivia, like how socioeconomic status shapes opportunities for students in the US, um, like in higher education, um, and also on climate change. She's looked at how different conflicts over class, racial inequalities, and gender have impacts on family life um, and in more like local or regional politics. She also spends time exploring how ideas surrounding young people and their place in society have changed since the late 1800s in Latin America and the US. And among these other interests, she's passionate about the climate crisis and teaches a class called Climate Change in Society, which encourages students to develop the democratic skills needed to adjust human policies in order to create a more sustainable relationship between people and the natural world. And today she'll be taking us through some of the basics about politics relating to climate change. She'll cover um, the impact of climate change and also what initiatives are being taken at different levels of government. Great. Thank you so much, uh, Grace and Noah. I'm just gonna share my screen and also Ava for inviting me. I'm delighted to talk to everyone here today. Oh, you know what? Once you stop sharing your screen, then I can share mine. All right, are we good? Can you see it? Great. Um, yes. Okay, so I teach at the College of New Jersey, TCNJ, 
And uh, my interest in politics, as uh, Grace has mentioned, it does emerge out of my interests that I've been following in Bolivia for a long time, but now I've been kind of bringing my interest in politics closer to home. And um, in terms of my talk today, I just wanted to first get a polling. When I say politics of climate change, I want you to first just like write down what do you think of? You know, it could be names, it could be ideas, it could be questions, just kind of take notes in a, take a, a note in an, in an open-ended way. Just kind of jot down your thoughts or questions. And now I wanted to just take a little bit more of a specific poll. If you don't mind sharing it now, I'm going to ask two questions. So if you can just take a moment and pick one option for question one and one option for question two, and I think we have a minute and then we'll see the results. I just want to get a sense of who's here and what kinds of questions and thoughts that you have. Um, before we get into the Q&A. And I should say in addition, it looks like the chat is available. If it is available and you have questions during the course of the talk, feel free to put them in there and then I'll see if I can swing back and address them at the end or even during. Is it available now? It's available, but it would be best if uh, people who wanna ask a question that would appear in the Q&A session afterwards, if they use the Q and A function on the bottom okay, of the screen. Okay, sorry. Yes. All right. So whenever it's available, if you want to just show it quickly, we'll take us. We'll get a sense for where people are coming from. Are you able to show that, or do I need to stop? Sharing? Uh, Let's see. I'm sharing results now. Okay. Awesome. All right. So big question then: <laughs> Why haven't people addressed climate change? That's the single biggest one. Also kind of the, the anything question, a few of us, and then um, what are the latest uh, developments here? All right, and then we also have a kind of a wide variety of potential ideas about what people can do. So I'm gonna be addressing both of um, like different facets of uh, both of these questions. So in terms of thinking about um, the approach here, first, I just wanted to get on the same page in terms of some of the most important climate change mechanisms and their impacts. And I'll draw a little bit from my research in Bolivia, and then talk about the concept of climate justice, um, which really gets us into one of the aspects of the politics of climate change. If we think of politics as um, relationships of power in many different areas, right? The formal politics that involves includes voting is, you know, one aspect, but then just, you know, how and why is it that some people are more vulnerable to risks from climate change? Um, what are the primary obstacles to action that many of you are interested in finding out about? Um, and then what are political actions that people are taking? And we'll look at those on multiple scales from the local to the national. All right. So this is just one example of um, political action that my students have taken. This was from the global climate strike that was most, mostly a youth-led strike in 2019. And um, they're on the campus of TCNJ calling for general, you know, a general call, a broad call, like, hey, take action on climate, everybody, right? Um, especially people who are in positions of, of political and economic power. In terms of the um, definition, of politics that I'm working from, as I mentioned, um, you know, it's just the Wikipedia definition, but, you know, basically here we're talking both about those kind of like who's in Congress and what are they doing and who is elected president, who is elected the mayor, or the governor, but then also group dynamics and how they're shaped by power, right? So it's, it's both that formal and then also that, that kind of multiple um, levels outside of the process of voting, electing people, and then the, the kind of preset modes through which those elected officials carry out their duties. 
So let's talk a little bit about climate change mechanisms. All right. Um, so think for a moment, and I guess I was thinking maybe I could hear you, but that's probably <laughs> um, not possible. So you could put it in the Q&A um, or Noah, Grace and Ava could just jump out with a few ideas um, in response to either, either of these questions. How do we know that climate change is happening? How do we know the climate is changing? And how do we know that people are responsible? Anybody? Do one of the three of you want to offer um, an example? Well, temperatures are changing and we can see a lot more natural disasters occurring in some areas a okay. lot more often. Yeah. All right. So we have Superstorm Sandy was an example, like right here in New Jersey, of course. Um, we can see the way in which just the measurement of temperatures, the surface temperature on land and at sea, um, when you average it out for any given year, it's going up year on year. I'm going to talk about a couple here. Um, so in terms of some of the areas in which we can look. So Noah mentioned temperature. He also mentioned the extremity, like extreme storms. Um, some of the other measurable ways in which we can see change happening in very, you know, at a very fast rate is um, in terms of the greenhouse gas layer, uh, the thickening of the greenhouse gas layer that keeps heat in from solar radiation, the keeling curve that I'll show you in just a minute, melting permafrost, which is like permanently frozen land that's permanently frozen, uh, mostly in the Arctic that's, that's melting, um, that hasn't melted for thousands of years. Um, the feedback loop where ice and snow being a lighter color than water um, has creates this feedback loop when it melts and the water is a darker color and then it absorbs more heat from solar radiation and then um, compounds itself in a feedback loop. So those are some of the some of the many ways, right? We're talking about multifaceted ways in which we can um, get a sense for what's happening and what's causing it, as well as these other ones that I've mentioned, such as the fact that deforestation is happening, we can see it as visible. Um, Noah mentioned the temperatures, we can see rising sea levels, we can measure those. So these are all kind of measurable elements that are some of the key components of, um, of the climate system and changes in the climate system. So just to make sure we're on the same page, um, the basic mechanism that shapes these other ones is that the earth would not, we would not have life on earth if there was no greenhouse, if there were no greenhouse gases, it would be like the moon. Um, so we need some greenhouse gases, but we're just adding so many that it's thickening that blanket and trapping um, solar radiation in the form of heat at a much higher, uh, to a much higher degree than prior to the industrial revolution. So um, the greenhouse effect, just the basics, you can think of it like a blanket and it's getting thicker, and it's, it's trapping the heat. Um, another item that I mentioned that, again, is one of the kind of ways that people have made visible this very abstract problem that, that Noah mentioned um, is called the Keeling Curve. So this was one of the most influential graphs to kind of make the round starting um, in the 1980s when they measured carbon dioxide concentrations in the air at this mountain in Hawaii, the Mauna Loa Observatory, and they realized that the concentration of uh, carbon dioxide in, in the air, just like right around the mountain, was increasing year on year. And they hadn't expected it. They thought that, you know, the world was big, you could cut down trees, burn coal, you know, do all your stuff, and it wouldn't really make an appreciable difference. But instead, you can see it's, it, it, it's making a measurable difference. So this curve was another visible manifestation, like, oh, we are changing the climate. Um, and so as, as Noah mentioned, um, we have these reports coming very frequently, <laughs> like alert, alert, problem. Um, and this one was just from uh, less than a month ago about the, um, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change issued its quote unquote bleakest warning yet um, about the, the degree um, to which the climate is changing and um, the impacts that are being felt, um, including in regard to wildfires, wildfires in this case in, in Northern Morocco. Okay. So like I said, part of thinking about the politics of climate change has to do with these 
imbalances of power. And so one of the things that you can see, like the minute you start looking at how are people being affected by wildfires, wildfires, droughts, extremes of um, heat, and in some cases, um, wilder swings in terms of um, greater cold, like we saw in Texas last year, um, we see an unequal impact. Um, so you know, again, think for a moment, you can take a note or you can put it in the Q&A if you want um, and think about this question, how do pre-existing inequalities create un unequal levels of risk? All right, so what is your sense that, um, you know, of how this occurs? Like, why is it that everyone is not at equal risk? And that's just something you can take note of, you can write it down if you want. So. Um, Um, one of the things that we see, if you look through, I'm just going to share some of the, some of the ones, right? These aren't all of them. Um, but when you start thinking about how our communities are set up, you see the ways in which these inequalities in terms of the lives that people were living already contribute to greater vulnerability for some people as compared to others right? in general, right? As a, um, as a pattern. Um, so Lower cost housing tends to be in places, neighborhoods within cities and towns that are greater um, at greater risk for floods as well as from pollution. And then, you know, pollution when there's a flood and there's pollution there, um, it can cause compounding problems. Um, you know, less money to you know deal with the consequences of extremes in um, temperature. Um, and again, we saw this in Texas quite a bit last year um, with those storms that they had. Um, neighborhoods that have fewer trees is something that they're finding, which can dramatically shape the temperature during a heat wave um, by as much as 10 degrees. Um, this was an example from um, uh, Atlantic City. There's a great article called The Injustice of Atlantic City's Floods, and it talks about how the process by which neighbors in any given place, people who live in any given place, um, can actually get money to rebuild or to, you know, move on or kind of, you know, um, deal with the impacts of damage to their property um, is really varied, and it tends to be the people who have the most political and economic power who tend to get um, the greatest share of those resources, even though you would expect that that you might not expect that that would be the case. Um, insurance is huge. <laughs> um, and you may know someone um, who is impacted by flooding, especially over the last couple of years, whether it was Superstorm Sandy or we've had rivers like the Schuylkill River had a flood. I live right outside Philadelphia and the Schuylkill River flooded a couple months ago. And some people were like, okay, I have insurance, it'll be okay. And other people were like, we couldn't afford insurance for our furniture business you know, everything is flooded, you know, we lost everything, right? Um, so insurance for home and business is, is a huge factor, especially in the United States where people who are more affluent tend to have insurance. Um, less money to move, you know, just the moving costs, putting down a down payment, um, all those kind of, you know, hauling your stuff, that kind of um, thing. And then um, less economic buffer for job retraining. You know, how, how do you manage to, you know, to shift where you are in the economy, what your economic role is in the economy. Um, so these are just some of the ways in which we can see like, oh, okay, you know, we can imagine this increased vulnerability um, of people who have less economic and political power. So that's kind of, I'm thinking more like within a country, within a city, within a region. Now I want to think about on the global scale and share a little bit of my research in Bolivia with you um, in as much as it relates to climate change. So I've done field work in Bolivia since 1995 as a cultural anthropologist. And this means basically, um, what we sometimes call deep hanging out. Um, so as Grace mentioned, my interests have been in socioeconomic class and how people who are the first in their families to go to college, how they deal with the fact that their parents, their fr childhood friends, their cousins, other family members, neighbors, um, don't have that level of education and often have a lower income. It can create, it has often created a lot of interpersonal challenges. And so that's one of the things that I've studied, but I've also observed over time, the impacts of climate change in the area where I worked. So here's Bolivia. And then I worked right where the name Bolivia is right here in the Cochabamba region, which is central Bolivia. Um, so here you can see the city where I worked. It's a major city of over a million people. And here I am with a friend, we're just going to sightseeing. Um, but this city is running out of water. Um, you may have heard of 
Cape Town, that Cape Town in South Africa is running out of water. This is another one of those cities where it's like, oh my God, what are we going to do? All of our sources of water are drying up. And although it's, um, it, it's a result of many factors, and some of them are long-term like deforestation in the area, it's also clear that water, the pattern of rainfall and collection of water that um, people use for drinking water has diminished and has been impacted by global climate change. So it's one of those places in the world that's like kind of drying out. Um, so um, a lot of people, you know, just walking around, like you strike up a conversation, people are really worried about water in this city. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, the people who have the fewest resources are the most vulnerable. So it tends to be the poorest neighborhoods that have the least access to water hookups. Um, and they're most dependent on um, like uh, public sources of water. So a lot of people over the last few years have started to have to purchase water from water trucks, which is incredibly expensive. So in some cases, they're the least, um, you know, the least affluent people are paying the most for the water. Um, another city in Bolivia um, that's glacier fed, that has glacier fed water, the La Paz, which is the capital, um, is also, is also like people are really freaking out um, because the source of water for the city is drying up. And in this case, it's from this glacier that seemed like it would supply, you know, infinite water, you know, for forever in the future. Um, but the glacier is shrinking. Um, so that is another city in, in Bolivia um, that's experiencing this problem. Um, and then we can see it on smaller scale, like in smaller towns too. Um, so there are are places like this so-called ghost town where drinking water, but especially water for people to grow crops and just like manage their household affairs has been drying up. And so even though they had put in this really fancy new soccer field, they couldn't make it and like most people are, are gone. Um, and so, you know, one of the things that I didn't think about as a non-farmer, but like, it's so wrenching, you know, it's like, you can imagine it's wrenching enough to have to leave your home, try to make a living somewhere else. Like, you know, your property values go down, you know, all of those things, but it's also emotionally wrenching to lose your source of livelihood. And a lot of people in the rural areas have livestock and they've told me how desperate and sad they feel like to watch their animals basically, you know, um, you know, die as a result of drought. Um, and then there are also floods in Bolivia, right? Like in many places in the United States where you see this, you know, these, these alternating extremes. So this is like the fourth biggest city of Bolivia within a year of these other events, you also have um, major floods um, as well as in Eastern Bolivia. So it's just one of those places where you can see a country where the people contributed very minimally to the creation of climate change as a problem, but they're feeling they're really vulnerable to the impacts. And so this is one of the major, um, uh, patterns that we see that the people who are least responsible for causing climate change, because they're not consuming cars, they're not consuming, um, you know, stuff, they're not, you know, turning on the heat, um, they're not buying much, um, but yet they're experiencing these impacts and have very little resources to you know, to, to escape it. One more pattern that I wanted to show, because I've been focusing more on the economic inequality, but we can also see um, the ways in which other forms of inequality, such as racism in the United States, can shape people's experience. So I mentioned earlier, like the existence of trees can kind of, you know, lead to, you know, you can live <laughs> with, with the um, temperature. Um, if you have trees around, and if it goes up a few more degrees, you'll see people, especially elderly people, people who are, um, have compromised immune systems um, who are not able to withstand the heat. And so there was a study that was done that came out two years ago um, that showed how if you look at a map, the places that were segregated, like neighborhoods that were segregated um, and um, in which um, uh, African-American, especially Latino, and in some cases, um, other uh, racially stigmatized groups, um, the only places where they could find housing tends to be the places today that you cannot find nearly as many trees as in wealthier neighborhoods. So this is Richmond, Virginia, um, but this is a very, you can go online and find it. it's a New York Times interactive map. And you can see how the neighborhoods that were zoned, that were redlined by real estate agents and lending agencies um, in the early 20th century, zoned as being for white tended to be cooler today and they have more trees 
And then um, conversely, the ones that were zoned as um, being for African American and other um, racial minorities were um, uh, today have many fewer trees and just kind of helping us understand this pattern of investment on the one hand and disinvestment in the other and the way that increasing temperatures can then affect the way people experience that, um, that difference today. All right, um, so um, just in terms of how anthropologists think about this, this political um, uh, issue of imbalance of power and unequal risk to the impacts of climate change, um, we often use this term climate justice, which some of you may be familiar with. And basically the idea of climate justice is um, encapsulated in this, um, you know, in this banner from um, a march in New York City in 2013. But basically the idea of climate justice encapsulates the recognition that um, climate change is happening, which was like in 2013 was a little bit less widely accepted in the US than, than today, um, that humans are largely the cause of it, that people are experiencing harm now, um, and that the most economically and socially vulnerable are often um, the most at risk from the impacts. And that it's this cruel irony that they tend to be the people who have consumed the least, who have had the least um, input in decisions that have been made that create um, greenhouse gas emissions that lead to deforestation, um, but yet they're, they're the worst impacted. And so as a result, this is kind of like the first part is kind of like the whereas, you know, recognizing these um, first five elements, then as a consequence, the concept of climate justice says, we need to do something about it. So we need to address climate change um, and we need to prioritize the well-being of the people who are most at risk for the harmful impacts of climate change. Um, so that's a key concept that anthropologists tend to use, such as myself, tend to use in trying to think about, okay, what's going on? You know, is this proposal for addressing climate change, will it promote climate justice or not? It's a kind of framework to try to evaluate what course of action should we take, um, what course of action should any of us like work on and devote ourselves to um, if we so choose. Um, so let's see here. So solutions, right? Again, I'm sure a lot of you have some ideas about what are some ways that um, that we could address climate change. So if you can, again, put them in um, in the Q and A. Um, um, I know there were some questions like, what's you know, what's the most important thing to do? What do we do first? Uh, where do we start? Right? With such a a multifaceted problem. But I'm sure you have some ideas, right? Um, ranging from the individual to like small groups to bigger groups um, on many levels. So just like take a moment and note down what are some of the solutions that you um, have heard of. Okay. All right, so for example, Grace mentioned a uh, Green New Deal or actually Abby mentioned uh, Green New Deal. Um, and Noah mentions answers to your questions can go in the chat and questions you have yourselves will go in the Q&A. Thanks. All right. So in terms of thinking about solutions, there's, there are many ways in, right? So many people have, you know, thought long and hard about, you know, what, what do we do first? <laughs> um, and one of those projects that I think is really fantastic and just that they've approached it from using a metric that says, what would be the most effective, you know, in terms of the technological solutions? So if the political will was there, what would societies do? Um, and they came up with this ranking um, in this book, Drawdown, uh, that's edited by Paul Hawken. And it's a, um, again, you can go online, drawdown.org. It's a whole, you know, it's a whole group. It's a, it's a network of people and organizations. And they have a list of the top 100 <laughs> and they have a methodology to evaluate, which, you know, like to explain why, you know, why they rank them the way they did. And I'm just going to show you, um, oops, show you a sampling. Um, and I know for myself, I was like, I was surprised, you know, some of these I knew about others. I didn't. So again, there's just the top 10 there's, they have a top 100 and then like some runners up, um, but refrigerant management. So managing the chemicals that, um, the gases that keep stuff cold in your AC, you know, air conditioning and um, uh, fridge and freezer, um, that's actually the top. That's the single most effective <laughs> by their metric. Um, and, 
you know, I don't know about you, it wasn't on my radar. Um, it was in terms of like ozone layer and, you know, the hole in the ozone layer, but in terms of climate, um, it was not. Wind turbines, you can see others that you may have thought of before, such as um, reducing the consumption of meat, um, reducing food waste. Um, they also talk about some political um, types of proposals, such as ed educating girls, um, which tends to lead um, toward people um, having the option to choose smaller families if they wish. Um, so you can get a sense for the range of potential solutions. And so from now on, I'm gonna talk mostly about broader um, struggles over groups of policies, as it were. So rather than focusing on like the politics of refrigeration management or the politics of tropical forest management, I'm gonna talk more um, in the, the broad term to think about what are the obstacles to implementing any of these and all of these as a suite of options on a wide scale. Right. Um, so thinking about what are the political obstacles to climate action. Noah mentioned a very important point, which is um, that climate change is a large problem and psychologists have found that people tend to run away from problems that seem overwhelming or that they tend to run away from negative you know, thoughts and run towards positive thoughts. So that's something that you can imagine everyone on earth is dealing with, no matter what their political you know, situation in their own country or region or town. But here I wanna focus more on the United States and thinking on the national and regional level of political obstacles beyond the kind of human nature challenges of dealing with climate change. Um, so in thinking about political obstacles, um, you know, one of the things we take a step back and we, you know, we know ostensibly we live in a democracy. So we do have to pay attention to opinion polls, you know, despite their limitations. Um, so this comes from Climate Communication, which is a Yale University project, and they have a lot of really like um, uh, great uh, reporting on polls that have been done, and this is based on uh, 2021. And so here, you can just think for your moment, for a moment, um, your own perception. So in thinking about what can facilitate or provide an obstacle to or block climate action, one component among many clearly would be how much do people in the US want, <laughs> want it to happen, right? Um, and one part of that question is um, how much are people thinking or talking about it with each other? Um, so you can see what you think about this, you know, 35% um, that discuss people of people who are polled discuss global warming at least occasionally. Um, so it could be a lot or it could be occasionally rather than not at all or hardly ever, which is 64%. Um, here, again, a kind of similar thing, but this is about the role of the media. Um, hear about global warming in the media at least once a week, 33%, right? So I myself, I'm in that 33%. I'm like, oh, they're talking about a lot, right? But obviously 66% of people they polled um, hardly ever or never, right? Um, another aspect in thinking about public opinion, that public opinion component of you know, the politics of climate change um, from the same set of data um, from Yale University based on 2021 polling. Um, again, you can think about how you, if it surprises you or doesn't surprise you, if you think it's a good sign or not a good sign in terms of thinking about what would facilitate effective action on climate that 61% of people polled thought that Congress should do more to address global warming. Um, the governor was 57%, um, thinking about the local government as well. So these different scales, the kind of the national, the state and the local. Um, you can take note and see what you think about, you know, what do you think about this finding that more people thought that citizens should address global warming, presumably as individuals, rather than the government although it wasn't a huge difference between what they thought the government should do and what citizens should do. And then similarly, whether it should global warming be a high priority for the next president or Congress, right? So we have above 50 in each case, kind of in the 50s and 60s for all of these questions. And then finally, I thought that this was an important thing to think about in terms of in an ostensible democracy, um, what do people think about potential harm over their lifetime? Um, from climate change. And you can see that slightly under half, um, just under half, 47% thought that global warming would harm them 
personally to a great or moderate amount, right? So that's from the US. And then just to kind of put the US in perspective, looking at um, another poll, this is from the Pew Charitable Trust Research, Pew Research, which is also a highly regarded um, research institute, um, looking across the so-called developed economy. So it's like, um, I think it was the 15 richest, wealthiest countries in the world. Um, when you look at how concerned are they, 72%. So we're talking like almost 30 percentage points higher, people feeling like they will be harmed um, by climate change. So it's significantly more in, in other countries. Um, and then they have this question, are you willing to make changes in how you live and work, which I think is sort of analogous to the, is it citizens or the government's responsibility here, All right? Um, but a lot of people, 80% said they'd be willing to change their, you know, their, their way of living to some degree, at least. All right, so that's the kind of, you know, as close as we can get to the, the public opinion poll. Um, and thinking about the US as a, you know, as a democratic society, what people want. Um, now let's talk about some of the, the interest groups and the way that they've operated. Um, so, um, and I'm assuming some of you may be familiar with this. If you, I would say like, especially the moderators, if someone, if you feel like, whoa, I didn't get that. Can you just repeat it? Feel free to like, you know, stop me, raise a hand and, and um, I can explain a little more. So in terms of political obstacles, one of the things that we see is the really successful way in which um, people who have a stake in fossil fuel generation have impacted politics very, very successfully to date. And so I'm gonna show you um, kind of one view into that. So if you look at, um, and this is like not exact, this is just a kind of conceptual map, but if you think about, Back in the 80s, um, when you know some of us were alive and others not, when you thought about um, how people identified themselves politically, it was quite different than the way it is today. So if you think about the kind of the hot button issues, and at that time, climate as an issue was not there. Um, environmentalism was, you know, like views about pollution and how much should the government restrict, um, you know, industries from polluting or from, you know deforestation or um, protection of endangered animals, you know, all that kind of stuff that you can think of um, under environmentalism, um, as well as all these other very hot button issues, such as abortion, um, you know, your views on racism, do you think, do you believe in a small government or a big government? How do you feel about taxes? Um, Democrat and Republican were much more all over the map than they are now. So at that time, you could be a Republican, you could vote Republican and say, but I believe in a bigger government in this way. I think that we should all have access to healthcare, but I think that there should be very few environmental re regulations or vice versa. And you could still be a, a Republican, right? Similarly, you could be um, a Democrat and say, you know what? I think abortion is a sin, but I vote Democrat because I believe in, um, that richer people should pay more taxes. So this kind of, you know, what, what we can see, what this um, is trying to depict here is the way that um, basically um, you don't have people identifying so strongly with a political party in quite the same way at that time as you do now, such that nowadays it's so much harder to say, you know, I'm a Republican and I really wanna take strong action on climate change. It's happening, but for a long time, it's been very entrenched um, where people have felt that their identity, everyone else they know, the identities of everyone else they know, um, really you know, circumscribe what they can be talking about, how they can understand the problems in, in US society. Um, so if this is what was going on in 1989, um, there's a whole like group of very, very wealthy people um, when you trace their political donations, you can see a very deliberate attempt to try to block, in this case, environmental legislation, any increased restrictions on what companies can do, whether it's you know, very localized pollution, like into a river, or into surrounding land, or uh, carbon emissions. Um, so David Koch has passed away a couple of years ago, but um, these two brothers um, have been, they're an example of very influential people who have used their money to fund groups that have helped galvanize um, people's 
in general, like grassroots opposition to climate action. So I know this is a long quote. Um, I'm not gonna read the whole thing, but just to summarize, basically, um, they, you know, investigative journalists who've looked into their stance on politics and what they've been trying to do found that they didn't care about abortion. They didn't care, you know, they thought gay marriage was a good thing, that there should be marriage equality. Um, you know, so they weren't, they didn't even, I don't know that they even took a stance on racism, right? So they didn't really care about those issues one way or another, or even supported them. But they knew that if they promoted political candidates that said, we think polluters should just be able to do whatever they want, we are, we own these polluting industries, coke industries, which um, they own includes um, uh, a lot of fossil fuel um, generation and, and burning of fossil fuel, you know, we know that not enough people would really stand by that platform. So we have to bring in these other issues and make them tied to those um, issues that relate to climate change. All right. Um, and so, and they certainly weren't the only people who are trying to bundle together abortion, views on racism, ideas about, you know, taxes um, altogether, but they were some of the more prominent, it's an example of a really prominent group. Um, so here is from Bernie Sanders website last year or two years ago when he was a, a political candidate um, and he's describing um, what they want. Um, and so as he describes here, they own oil refineries. They've been trying to shape public opinion in such a way that people will not support any restrictions on fossil fuel industries, right? Um, and so, and he's featuring them obviously, cause they're like, you know, they're the, um, you know, they're, they're some of the, um, of the biggest funders of politicians who oppose effective action on, on climate change. And so to kind of sum up the fiscal and social agenda into a single conservative worldview, um, basically they're saying the fiscal is like, don't regulate dirty industries, don't reduce fossil fuel emissions because it'll hurt the bottom line, it'll hurt the profits of companies that are in that business. Um, don't raise taxes on wealthy people. That was the kind of stuff they cared about. And then the social agenda is like abortion, uh, school choice, um, all these other issues that don't have a direct economic component, but they successfully created think tanks and other, um, other institutions that help people see that if I'm a conservative, I got to be in line with this fiscal agenda, as well as the social agenda that I, that I believe in. And so that's how we get to like now, this entrenchment of these um, of these political lines in a way that then has made it so hard. Like it's just, you're just starting to see a wave, especially of younger conservatives who are saying we need to take action on climate. I believe in small government. I oppose abortion, but I wanna take action on climate change, right? So that's, that's a very new thing that's really just emerging in the last couple of years, right? But this is the kind of, this is what people like the Koch brothers were able to achieve over the past couple of decades. And it's been one of the reasons why you can see um, the blockage of many potential policies at the national level and the state level to try to address climate change, to limit fossil fuel emissions and to say, promote renewable energy. Um, and so you can see an example of someone who was like shaped by this environment. Um, uh, Senator Ted Cruz <laughs> um, is like the first person I think of, even though there's so many more. Um, you know, where he's the, um, the senator in, a, in an oil producing and gas producing state and has been funded by, by people like the Hope Brothers and have promoted congressional hearings and many public statements saying either that climate change is a hoax or that it's just too expensive for the economy um, to do anything about it. We're just looking at the questions here. Um, okay, so, um, so to bring us up to today, um, and I think I have about five more minutes. Is that, would you say that's right? Five or 10 minutes, if five you Five or need. 10, okay, all right. Um, okay, I'll try to um, not talk about too long because I want to hear your questions. But in terms of like today, all right, or you know, this week, March 16th, 2022, um, this is an article from, from Vox.com, a political analysis, um, a left-leaning political analysis website saying like, what happened to Build Back Better? And Build Back Better was a big um, um, kind of 
a uh, cluster of initiatives that was being promoted by President Biden and also um, many Democrats in the Senate and the U.S. House of Representatives, and it included a lot of climate action. Um, so it included job retraining in you know, wind, wind turbine um, construction and management, solar installation, um, retrofitting homes and businesses, buildings to make them more energy efficient and, and, and the like, as well as incentives for people to buy electric cars and, and um, such. So um, basically there just weren't enough senators <laughs> that supported it. And the key person who wound up being like the, the last senator um, who could make or break um, the bill has been um, Democratic Senator Joe Manchin of West Virginia. Um, and so what's interesting here is that, first of all, in thinking about, you know, what is the larger pattern that explains, you know, why he doesn't want it, <laughs> why he doesn't want the bill, why he's reluctant to take climate action among other um, opposition that he has to other parts of the bill, like funding uh, child care and, and, and such. Um, but, you know, it's interesting to take note that, you um, Senator Joe Manchin is very popular in his state. Um, he, or I'll, I'll, I'll get to some of the others later. So he, um, as I'll talk in a little bit, he was actually uh, lobbied by coal miners in West Virginia saying, please support Build Back Better because it includes funding for us to get job retraining so that we can actually move from being coal miners to working in um, alternative energy, sustainable energy um, uh, fields. Um, but it turned out when people did a bit of digging um, that Manchin had a pretty strong alliance with um, coal mine owners as opposed to workers. And so the question is just at what point would coal mine workers say, you know, we're giving up on Joe Manchin, we're going to support someone else to run for office and challenge his Senate seat. That has not happened yet. Right. So in thinking about like right now, right, um, you know, the one Republic or excuse me, the one Democrat who's who's kind of, um, you know, um, uh, stating his opposition to significant climate action. In this case, we can see the way in which, you know, it really is part of this larger ecosystem in which companies that contribute to fossil fuel emissions have been very effective in using their money to um, to um, stop action. So now let's talk a little bit about um, what people are doing, right? Um, including those coal miners. So um, I wanna talk a little bit about state and local and there's New Jersey is actually, I'm in Pennsylvania. New Jersey is way ahead of Pennsylvania in climate action. Um, so there's a lot of stuff that the government is actually doing that any of you who are interested in taking action, you could actually like work together with your state government um, to carry out a, a effective climate action. So um, this is this is just from the um, the you know if you Google climate change in New Jersey, this is like the main page that you get to, um, and you can see in fact New Jersey is one of the most is the states where um, the governor over the past four years and the administration have taken. Um, like significant action. Um, and so, um, you know, you can see that in a huge expansion of funding for solar panels, um, which we see at TCNJ. There's this huge new solar array that's being constructed right now over several of our big parking lots. Um, and that's the fruit of like basically, you know, pouring resources into alternative energy sources, wind turbines and solar, especially. Um, another um, area in which you can see New Jersey taking action is by joining what's called the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative. And I don't have a slide on that, but it's actually really, people call it REGI, it's R-G-G-I. Um, and that's basically trying to create like a, like a small group of states that will work together to reduce, um, to increase sustainable energy and, and, and reduce emissions. Um, as a group to get that economy of scale and to help support each other. Um, so New Jersey as a state, there's a lot going on. You know, anyone who wants to be a teacher, who is a teacher, there's a lot of climate education going on. It's it's like way better. Even just the website compared to PA is just like much better. Um, and then in terms of the local level, like people who are, um, there are people who are working right now in many towns and cities, including in New Jersey, um, creating and then trying to implement climate action plans. So we did it in my town as a small town of 4,000 people in Pennsylvania, just like part of the greater Philadelphia area. There's similar things going on in many towns 
um, and the climate action plan is like the key word where you can see if you Google your town or your county and climate action plan, you'll see what people have done, but there have been many. Um, some of them work with an organization called Sustainable Jersey, um, which has been a very strong network across, um, across um, the state just trying to implement like, okay, let's put another bike path here. Um, let's shut this street down to cars on Saturdays so that you know pedestrian people can feel more comfortable walking into town and buying stuff or getting a cup of coffee, right? So anything from those really small things to like, hey, let's put up a solar array in this field that we have over here. Um, or um, let's um, get our municipal energy, let's buy it from renewable resources. So those are really like, there's a lot of people in New Jersey that I met who are, who are working on that, um, and it may include some of you. Um, so that's at the state and municipal level. Now let's talk a little bit more about the national level. Um, and I'll try to keep it to just four more minutes. So, um, and I'll go kind of fast, and then if there are any examples that you want me to return to, just you know, just make a note of it. So as I mentioned, coal miners were, um, they came out publicly in opposition to Senator Manchin's decision not to back the, um, the Build Back Better Act, which in included a big component of, of climate change legislation, um, climate action. Um, and so, um, you know, just the fact that they took the stance, which is the first time in my knowledge that they have publicly supported, you know, usually, it's been a constituency that's had a lot of symbolic weight in the country because they're working class people, we're doing a really dangerous job and you wanna make sure in any, you know, thinking about climate justice, any like actions that a society takes, you wanna like, they have to take care of people who are working in those industries that would be phased out. So they have this really kind of symbolic advantage for people like the Koch brothers, people like Senator Manchin um, who are, you know, don't need those coal mining jobs, but are, you know, are glad for the kind of moral support from the coal miners. Um, but they came out at the end of last year and they said, you know, please reconsider your, your position. They didn't say, hey, we'll stop voting for you, which would be the next step. Um, but here um, the, the mine said, you know, please um, make sure that we have the funding for healthcare as well as the, um, as well as the tax incentives to, um, you know, to create alternative sources of employment. So that's one. Another kind of movement on the national level is, as I mentioned earlier, there's this um, burgeoning movement, it's fairly new, of people who self-identify as conservatives um, who are coming out and saying, we need climate action. And so one of the um, most visible people is has been former um, South Carolina Republican Congressman Bob Inglis. Um, and so he has he has made many public statements. This is just the most recent one that I've seen, which was from um, um, uh, this past December. There's this podcast here from, from National Public Radio, How I Changed My Mind About Climate Change. Um, and he went, as part of his congressional duties, he went to Antarctica. And he saw the, the evidence in the little bubbles trapped in the ice over, you know, doing these cores that represent ice that, you know, was created many um, thousands of years ago and said, oh my God, <laughs> climate change is real. And this is like 2010 or 2009, 2010. Um, and so then he started trying to campaign for conservatives to address climate change. He was not reelected, right? In a landslide, he was not reelected. Um, so it's been a tough road for him politically. Um, and he, he took a principled stance and you know lost, but he is trying to promote free market solutions to climate change, such as putting a price on carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gas emissions paid for by fossil fuel companies, all right? So this is just a, um, like a summary of what his, um, this energy and enterprise initiative um, with a focus on carbon pricing, meaning make the economy recognize the high costs that fossil fuels and carbon emissions and other greenhouse gases have you know, to, to society make them more expensive to sell um, if you're a fossil fuel producer. Um, so now I just wanna give you a few quick examples from my class at TCNJ, at the College of New Jersey. So I've taught this um, course, Climate Justice and Social Action for the last however seven years or so um, to try to help students understand what are the, what's the process in trying to like 
be part of or form a group on the local level or join a national group and get people involved and make it powerful, even though you don't have a lot of money and you're not, you know, the president of the United States and you're not the Koch brothers. Um, so we use this organizing, this book that helps guide students through that process it's called community organizing. Um, and so, and they work on policy changes. So they, they think about whether it's at the campus level, like for TCNJ to change its environmentally related policies to be more sustainable, um, or if it's at the statewide, like, hey, we want the state of New Jersey, we want the governor to sign a law that devotes X amount of money to, um, to you know, wind generation or to um, try to stop uh, gas pipelines going through various parts of New Jersey, lots of pipelines in New Jersey, um, or on the national level supporting something like the Build Back Other, uh, Better Act. So that's what they're working on. And um, there's a lot of steps that they learn. <laughs> I'm not gonna go through all of these, but you can get a sense of like building people power is like, it, there's a lot involved. But the basics are getting like making a plan, um, figuring out what policy you want to have happen, and then getting as many people as you possibly can involved and showing up and demonstrating their support for it. That's the basics, right? That's what all of this is, is oriented towards, right? Um, so, you know, I'm gonna just skip uh, there. You know, we have tools to kind of show that like everyone had a tough time <laughs> to start. Um, so I'll just show you like, um, you know, and thinking about something that seems so uncontroversial, like much less controversial than climate change or action on climate change, which is women's suffrage, like just can women vote or not, um, in thinking about um, what the terrain looked like, you know, in the late 1800s, there are a lot of people who are opposed, right? a lot of people, you know, more than half did not want it to happen, right, um, and then by the time they secured the women's right to vote, there still were quite a few people who were opposed, but they got more than half of people to get on board and to be really active. Um, and today, you know, the vast majority of people, but not everyone is really on board with women having the right to vote. So these are the kinds of things that we talk about um, in the class to kind of help students get like, you know, not feel so overwhelmed. So I'm gonna just share one example with you and then you, if you want other examples, I can show you in the Q and A. Um, so one group um, in this class decided to join the Citizens Climate Lobby, which is a national grassroots group trying to get a bipartisan agreement among senators and Congress people like in Washington, DC to price carbon. So that thing I mentioned with the Republican Senator Bob Inglis who said, let's put a higher price on fossil fuel emissions, on carbon dioxide emissions, um, and that will, that will then help the market you know, kind of work. So he's a Republican who came out in favor of this legislation. And then there are a lot of Democrats who are like, sure, we also want to do other stuff. But this is one thing that we can get behind. And this is one thing that both Republicans and Democrats potentially could agree on in Congress. So these students did a lot of outreach on campus and tried to get a lot of um, like other students involved. And it's just one of their many like tabling outreach events that they had um, right outside the cafeteria. And then they did some research on um, carbon pricing, um, which I think I just explained. Um, so they kind of looked into it like, okay, I think I get it. You know, they had to kind of learn about it. Um, they did posters and flyers and social media. Um, so this was, you know, one of the things that they did as part of that process. Um, and then um, they analyzed who their local congressperson was for New Jersey, and it's um, U.S. Rep. Bonnie Watson Coleman in Ewing. Um, and so they tried to get her to come out really strongly and make public, like, de public demonstrations of support saying, yes, I approve, you know, like, I really want this to happen, this carbon um, fee. Uh, program that Citizens Climate Lobby was focusing on. Um, and then we actually, they got funding and went, oops, and they went to Washington, D.C. and went to the Citizens Climate Lobby Conference and they actually met with some of their um, elected representatives and said, hey, please support this or you already support it, please, um, you know, please support it more, um, you know, more, more vocally, Cre helped create a groundswell. So, um, in the interest of time, I'll leave it there. Oops, I'm very happy to um, to answer any questions. I have a lot of there are a lot of organizations, and you know, like just 
grassroots groups and then like larger, you know, um, uh, institutions that are nationwide that have local chapters there are a lot of ways to get involved in um, working on climate action. So thank you very much. And I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Professor Shackow. So it looks like we have a couple of questions in the chat right now that I'll start reading out. Okay. So um, the first question someone asked was, what is the most important thing we should address first, which you answered. So I'm gonna move on to the next one. So Abby said that clearly public pressure will be crucial in passing policies for both climate justice and fighting carbon emissions. In the US, um, since politics are very polarized, do you have any advice about how we educate people who don't believe in this science or that discrimination exists? Or is it not worth it to argue with people who are so deep in conspiracies? Yeah, so I think it's a great question. And I would say um, it's not worth it. Yeah, so if you think about that, if you remember that little thing I just showed where it's like the spectrum of support, there are enough people who are like, um, you know, feel like they, you know, they just need a little nudge or a little in more, I would say more an invitation, not a nudge, but an invitation to be involved. There are many more people like that, that are just like, you know, not quite sure what to do, or they feel a little shy, or they want to show up to an event or do something, but they are like, oh, I don't know anyone who's there. My friends aren't really talking about this. You know, there's, there's so many people like that, that that would be the first place to go. Those would be the people who are like interested. And then you could kind of go to the people who are neutral, where they're like, on the one hand, on the other hand, I think it's happening, but I'm concerned about, you know, do we really know what the best next steps are, you know, and kind of work your way. The truth is you don't, you never actually need to focus, like the vast majority of people would, would take action if they knew how, if they felt comfortable, if they had like more of a pathway to get there. All right, the next question is, um, you suggest rightly that we need to develop policies to address the issues causing climate change, but you also point out that the so-called first world is less impacted by the consequences than other places like Bolivia. Thus, our political incentive to pass such legislation is much less urgent. How do you suggest one respond to this structural problem? Good, yeah, great question. So, um, you know, Again, it's kind of similar to the former question where I think that even a couple years ago, that might have been, um, you know, I think it's getting a little easier, unfortunately, because the impacts are getting greater and so more people in the US have been impacted. Um, I do think, you know, I'm, you're absolutely right that if everyone, if there was like massive forest fire around everyone's house and people that didn't have insurance and they didn't have a way out, um, you know, and it would be like, it would, it would be, you know, there would be much more incentive, but I do think actually that at this point, my, you know, just based on the work that my students have done and like with me kind of, you know, seeing how it's been going and then also like work that, um, I've done on my own. I mean, um, I think that there are enough people who really care and feel very deeply about it. The issue is more like creating on ramps for them to take action. Um, you know, I think that they feel motivated and concerned, but in the US, a lot of people don't have a great education in those kinds of things like how to hold a meeting or it's okay to feel embarrassed if you call someone up or you text them or whatever and you're like, hey, come to my meeting. And they're like, why the hell? But I would do that. You know, <laughs> um, you know what I mean? It's like, it's, I think it's more about the skills at this point and focusing on getting those skills and finding the, the niche in which each person wants to work, whether it's more like plants or animals or psychology or, you know, those different, you know, policy, like energy policy, you know, there's all these different ways in. I think that at this point, there are enough people who are really concerned that again, you could kind of start with them and have, you know, try to help galvanize that concern and it would create a great deal of pressure. Um, I have a question for you, Professor Shaka. Mm -hmm. um, so many people that I've talked to about climate change, they say that all the responsibility is on the big corporations and the government to address these issues. Mm -hmm. But I personally have always thought that you know, industries, they re rely on supply and demand, which gives individuals a lot of power. And so I always thought that um, it's a com 
you need a combination of both individual change and also government action and change by the big corporations. And I would just like to know what you think about that. So, you know, I do have to say from my perspective as a cultural anthropologist, where we're really looking at the interface between the individual person and the groups that they're part of, um, I do feel like you get more bang for your buck working collectively. And I'll get, you know, I think that one example can be, um, you know, some of you may have observed, like there's this kind of, there's this challenge right now, which is that, um, you know, the the Russian government invaded Ukraine. There's like fluctuations in availability of gas and oil um, from Russia and the price has been fluctuating. And then a lot of people are like, oh no, do we need to produce more oil and gas? Cause we don't have enough sustainable energy sources at the moment to be like, okay, you know, let's just transition like tomorrow, you know, actually today, you know, like literally today, we, we can't do that. Yeah, we don't have enough wind turbines and solar panels and, um, and other sources built yet. Um, so in that case, we can see how it's like, you know, that's really tough because as an individual, you got to get to work. You have to put gas in your car. Like you need, you know, it's like you need the gas because you're stuck in the, you know, you're stuck in the structure that, that you live in. Um, on the other hand, so I think it's, I think it's actually a more specific thing. I would say like as a consumer, um, it has to be a consumer boycott to have an impact or like a campaign, like a social media shame campaign. It can work for some, but not others. And so I think for fossil fuel companies, it's very hard, you know, it's just, there's so much demand for their product, even among people who like hate the product, um, you know, so, so that's really hard. I think like there are some brands and some, some products that are more vulnerable, say to a shaming campaign or a boycott than others, but I don't think it can be done individually. You know, like I decided a while ago, my husband and I were like, ah, we can't buy from Amazon anymore. It's not effective at all <laughs> because it's not a campaign. <laughs> you know, it's not an organized thing. Amazon has no idea that we decided not to buy from them. So it's like totally ineffective. However, we were just like, we can't do it. So but but we know that it's just not doing it's not having any impact on their bottom line on the other hand i just i happen to have this here i don't know if you can even see it there if it's like showing up backwards or not can you read it there yeah so my friend and i this is vanguard is an investment company and invest people's like retirement money and my friend kate was like ah, i gotta do something about climate change so she found out about this campaign and we just like went around and we like talk to people who are out and about and we're like, hey, will you call them and say, um, you know, we want you to switch away from fossil fuel investments. And we knew it was a drop in the bucket, but we were also like, you know, it is part of a campaign. And we were starting to think about how can we get more people on this campaign and make it bigger? Like it's a, there's a structure in place so that you could, you could make it bigger, you know, just us talking to 10 people at the park, you know, it's not gonna move it, but if, you know, we could contribute to it being, you know, part of a larger thing because, because the campaign exists, you know? Um, and I think that gets to, someone asked, I wanna get involved in this struggle, but fear that anything I would achieve is too small and insignificant. How do you suggest we deal with the challenge of scale? And I would just say like, find a few friends or a few people who you like hanging out with and just work on it with them. Like, you know, if every, like if many more people did that, not even everyone, there would be so much more action. You know, it's just, it's hard to take that step, but you know, you have to, it does require just making peace with this is a big problem. No one person can solve the whole thing. Everyone has their, their piece to play, but with the caveat that I think like just as a consumer or like me just turning off the lights, which I'm constantly <laughs> turning off the lights, is not making a dent. But I do think that like joining up with some kind of campaign that could be, you know, that has the structure where people know about it and it has visibility and they're writing press releases and, you know, that's a worthwhile, like anything like that is worthwhile to put your energy. Uh, I have another question as well. Um, so uh, I've been interested in climate change for a while. I changed some of my habits. I went vegan a few years ago and I got interested into the animal rights movement. And uh, as I did some research a few years ago, I re learned that reports by the FAO, the United Nations, Oxford University show that animal agriculture, the livestock industry, is one of the leading causes of climate change responsible for 
more greenhouse gas emissions than the entire transportation sector. But mm-hmm. still, the U.S. never really addresses the livestock industry in any of its policies. So I was wondering, how would you suggest we could get politicians to actually address animal agriculture in their climate change policies? Yeah, that's a, that's, it's a very good question. I do think that, again, again, I think that it, each sector is specific. And so I think that, um, you know, and, and, and each sector is specific, and then you need some kind of substitute that's like, that seems viable to you, you know? So I, like, I totally support, and I've had students in my climate change class and their whole thing, like at first, like they, they've been trying to get our, Sodexo is a big corporation that runs our, caf- our cafeterias. Um, and they've been trying to get Sodexo to like have better plant-based food options. And that's a tough road, but they, you know, like several years in a row, students have been trying to do that. Um, so that's one place, like in terms of um, like political will, I do think that the creation of good tasting burgers, and this is not, this is just like my view. So, you know, and we could sit around and like hash out, but I think that for each, for each sector and almost like for each kind of class of product, like say beef or, you know, hamburgers, steak, cheese, you know, um, you'll, you, for things that people really depend on now that are not like, you know, an Amazon echo or something that you could be like, eh, you know, whatever, just ditch it. Um, I think that you need a viable alternative. And so now we have those. So I think that now that there's a beyond burger and an impossible burger, and maybe some other ones like that, you could, um, you know, you could say something like, you know, and, and there may be a campaign out there like, Hey, you know, promote the development of more foods like that, put federal funding into research and development of those foods. Um, so that's, that's one thing at the kind of political level you could. Another thing um, might be at the smaller level, it could be statewide, like guidance for New Jersey cafeterias. Um, it could be like lobbying the, um, the US Department of Agriculture, which has a huge say over like school lunches, um, you know, lobbying them and like, you know, ha- you know, there's probably campaigns about that. So I think it would, you know, for each of these, there's like, many pathways in and you have to kind of look at like, okay, these people are going in through the USDA, you know, trying to change school lunches. These people are trying to get funding for research and development. Um, These people are trying to get their school cafeteria to offer beyond burgers once a week instead of hamburgers or, you know, so, you know, you kind of see one, you're like, okay, that makes sense to me. I'm going to try working on that for a while and see how it goes. Does that address your question? Thank you. Sure. Um, I think that will wrap up the Q&A for now. Um, So I'm going to share my screen. Um, So uh, as we wrap up this Q&A, one moment. As we wrap up this Q&A, I would like to sincerely thank Professor Shakow for giving us such an inspiring lecture. That was really great. Um, I would also like to thank everyone for coming and watching and engaging the talk through your questions and comments. Uh, Before we conclude today's session, I would like to end with a message of hope in the form of some very powerful quotes. Um, So here it says, better to light a candle than curse the darkness. Uh, The origin of this quote is unknown, although it has been attributed to Eleanor Roosevelt and Confucius and some other people. Uh, Yeah, very uh, weird set of people, different people. Um, Along the same lines, uh, uh, renowned conservationist and primatologist Jane Goodall once said that if we all lose hope, there is no hope. Without hope, people fall into apathy. There is still a lot left that is worth fighting for. It is important to remind ourselves of how much all of us can still do for the planet. This lifts us out of apathy and in action and stimulates the global collaborative effort that we need in order to effectively combat climate change. I would also like to remind you all of the lectures we will be hosting in the upcoming weeks, and we hope you will be able to join us for some of them. Thank you for your time, everyone, and have a great evening. Thank you.